Good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, to our interview with Ilya Baranikov. He's running as a candidate for House District 6. Before we get started, a um, little bit about Huli Pak. Huli Pak was birthed uh, from a shared drive to rework our system by seeking INA based equity focused leadership for our Hawaii Island community. Now more than ever, we need leaders who are willing to circle back to our roots and instill real change in our community from Kona to Ka'u to Hilo to Havi. The time is now to Huli the system. Conducting our interviews tonight are Antu Harvey and Monica Stone. And I wanted to just uh, briefly have uh, Antu or Monica describe the, uh, the new boundaries for District 6, since a lot of people might not know that. I'll try and uh, put a photo up here. So with it's the census, happening. it's typical every 10 years, depending on the census about the population and movement in Hawaii, about um, the allocation about how many districts there are for each, um, uh, both counts, county councils and then the legislature, Senate and House of Representatives. And Hawaii Island gained enough population that we were, a, a, a new district was created and it was decided that it would be in Kailua Kona area. So in, in Kona, central Kona. And it basically runs um, about on the north end from right in Kailua village where Hualalai um, meets the beach or Ali'i Drive, runs up Mauka, like around the Judd, comes down to the Judd Trail, drops down southerly um, to Kona Waina School, uh, goes down to Mamalahoa Highway, and then drops um, southerly from there to, and picks up a loop around the Hona now and Napo'opo'o area, and then along the coastline comes back up, up to Kailua Kona. So it's a, a very kind of central, small district, um, pretty dense. So here we are. Thank you. Awesome. Great job. Well, all right, who's going to uh, ask our first question? For, oh, <clears throat> oh, before we get started, Ilya, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about why you, why you chose to run for uh, House District 6? Right. Um, so yeah, with the new district and stuff, um, I felt like just looking at the Everyone else has been enrolled to, to run the race. Um, not really my type of policy. And I was thinking like, you know, just even putting out the intention of the progressive democratic platform is gonna start generating dialogue. Um, and whether we win or not, fingers crossed, we will. Um, I'm telling everyone we will. Um, but just even having that dialogue of creating these ideas and putting it on the forefront of everyone's minds and, and creating some sort of solutions to all the problems that are kind of like data-driven, uh, thought out, um, and support the Aina and the local population here. Uh, I think just doing that is service enough for the community. Um, and you know, if we do end up being successful, then we can actually enact some of that change. So I think you know, in any case, it's, it's helping the situation out um running right now thank you Atu or monica yes uh thanks hello um my question first question is how have you advocated for the kona community and what community projects have you worked on right so um most recently um well so let me get started with just kind of my background so you understand um the dynamics at play um I'm an artist, musician, uh, working artist, designer, um, and I'm running a nonprofit here um, in Hawaii as well. Um, and specifically in Kona, I was at the um, pro-choice rally and I set up a big sound system. I got everyone's butts shaken with some funk music and kept the vibes high. Uh, and so being there, supporting the community for activism, it's um, a passion for me. I've been out on the streets um, in New York for Occupy, Iraq uh, war invasion, um, you know, several protests in, D in DC, Washington, DC. Um, so I've been active in activism for quite a while. Um, generally speaking for the islands where uh, we have a program called uh, Hawaii Fi, um, and it is an arts-based mentorship program for underprivileged youth. 
Uh, and I can go on and on all day about it. I usually do to people, but essentially just to get a quick recap of it, it's a, uh, it's an arts program. It's essentially like big brother, big sister with ukuleles, guitars, paintbrushes, uh, and creatives, uh, mentoring the youth, like people, you know, a lot of communities here that don't have access to, um, disposable income to provide creative outlets for their kids. So, um, as an artist, I feel like that's a necessity for people, especially children. Uh, at a certain developmental stage that they have access to creative outlets. So that's what I'm here doing. And um, that's the way I support the community the best way I can. Was that the nonprofit that you mentioned? Correct. Hawaiifi.org, if you guys want to check it out. Um, yeah. Definitely. Sounds like a cool, cool program. Thank you. So Ilya, what are the critical issues in your district that you would set as your priority and focus on to pass legislation to help resolve? Um, <clears throat> there are several issues. I think, um, you know, just kind of the more pressing ones obviously are affordable housing, education, uh, homelessness. Um, those three I think would be kind of at the top uh, pressing issues for people. There's are obviously larger scale issues, climate change, environmental stuff. Um, but for right now, people are suffering. They're in the streets. They're not able to afford um, the basic necessities. They're working their butts off and they're getting back less and less every year. The social contract uh, for society is fundamentally uh, shifting um, in America, unfortunately. Uh, so we have to address those issues first. Um, and a lot of those issues are kind of intertwined into each other. So when you say affordable housing and homelessness, obviously those two things are literally hand in hand, right? Um, and so <clears throat> those are the three main issues, I think. There's, yeah, obviously tons of other ones I can go on all day. Do you guys want to address like one by one, which, which ones? I think we might circle back around. Okay, um, great. So, some of our other questions where you can elaborate. Excellent. Yep. True. Yeah, we definitely <laughs> go into a lot of those issues. Um, right. How online. much time do you guys have? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, right. you have you have as much time as you want to, you know, um, or actually, I think there's a time limit, maybe like three there minutes. Has to be, yeah. You're not going yeah. over it yet. Yeah. No. Okay, cool. So um, in what ways would you create equitable spaces for your community's input as a legislator? How would you? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, sorry. Would, Keep going. No, no, no. Uh, how, sorry. Would you, how would you accommodate those with low access to technological resources and other communication barriers? Right. So um, the United States, obviously not great with broadband access. Um, lots of other places way less developed than we are have way better infrastructure for that. Um, I think subsidizing some of the communications, uh, I think partnering with um, different organizations to provide that infrastructure, obviously with governmental oversight to make sure things are happening efficiently, effectively and equitably. Um, but that's a huge one. People are very rural here. They live out in the sticks uh, and they need access to information. Um, as, as that was kind of a two part question, I think. So the first one was, how would you uh, basically communicate with your constituency and have like a very representative take on this community right so that's number one so i think in that case i'm a huge fan of like direct democracy uh and as a representative um i think having a digital platform where there's actually polling i can get super granular with people's opinions on certain things um i'm like a data guy i love research i love statistics i love data i love solutions based on data um i'm less emotional like i <clears throat> That seems to be a lot of the other parties <laughs> that are based on <clears throat> policies, very emotional. Uh, I, like to, I like to look at the role of government as being uh, research and solution oriented um, and as efficient as possible too. Um, so um, having a platform on a website, having polling through text messages, having my constituents obviously be able to harass me all day if they want um, is fine. Um, and uh, you know, I've been going around the neighborhood even today and, and yesterday, just asking questions and seeing where people's opinions are on certain things and what's the most pressing issues for them. So um, yeah, I think I answered those backwards. So I did the broadband thing and then I did the, the first question, but hopefully it's like a little bookmark. Um, cool, next question. 
Okay, um, <clears throat> how would you engage the county council to find equitable solutions to community issues that have both county and state authority components? Right, I think having forums, discussions, town halls, um, and trying to engage the community. What happens a lot in modern times or in times of economic uh, instability is people will start retracting from their interactions with the government uh, because of distrust, because things aren't working properly. They'll get um, disinterested in affairs locally um, and they'll just throw up their hands. That's why we have uh, anti-establishment figures like <clears throat> the Trump man that came in uh, because people are just tired. So I think trying to reestablish some trust with government and the constituency is like a huge thing. Uh, I think showing people that there are people in government that are working for them and that are representing them is a huge thing uh, because if you don't have that support, uh, nothing's, you know, nothing's gonna happen and, and your constituency is not gonna be very effective in, in asking for representation. So I think having forums created is a good, a good uh, solution to that problem. That's really excellent. And maybe my question wasn't really good, but it was actually, um, I, what I wanted to see is what your um, response would be about, um, we don't really, the, the state legislators and the county council people right. don't tend to work together. Totally. Every, <clears throat> so that's my question is kind of right. like, how would you maybe yeah, as I was saying, <clears throat> having a forum where there's a common meeting place um, is a good is a great idea. Having accountability, if there's some sort of interactions that are made public, um, that you know, it's like when you email someone and you're just emailing them and they never respond to you, but then you CC ten people and then suddenly they're there and they're responding to your questions. It's kind of like accountability at a community level. If there's people involved um, and if there's a uh, a collective energy going around. I think that's when people are going to be more engaging. And, you know, sometimes there are issues of communication. We just have to address those like one by one. There's a myriad of different ways we can create solutions to that one specific problem, but we have to address things, I think, as they come. But yeah, having a forum, community, you know, town halls are great. Having people engaged, making them entertaining and interesting. Having a couple of wackos there talk about weird stuff would be good. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're gonna switch up a little bit, talk about uh, the homelessness problem. So homelessness remains a problem statewide, including on Hawaii Island. Um, what would you do to come to grips uh, on this persistent problem? Right, and this is one of the most complicated problems, um, I think in you know modern America, essentially. Um, and we can go into like philosophy and the roots of like what homelessness is, how it relates to capitalism in general, um, how it's, you know, used by people in positions of power to kind of wag a stick for everyone else to get in line and make sure they're appreciative of their low wages. Um, but essentially it's, it's a lack of social services. Uh, it's lack of access to mental health uh, services. It's lack of jobs. Um, Obviously living wage is a huge one. If you can't afford to live in a house, even if you're working full time, that's usually a bad thing. Uh, it's not very difficult in those kind of numbers to look at what, how the solutions would come about. Um, I think also there's stigma around homelessness, a huge amount of stigma. People, they don't want to feel, since they don't think there's a direct solution for it, which there are, there's many solutions for it. They just think it's a problem that should be kind of swept under the rug. So even emotionally on a personal level, when you see someone that's homeless, uh, you have this like, this instinct to just kind of, you know, shell up and not really deal with emotionally what's going on inside yourself that society allows this to happen. It's really, it's quite terrible, right? Because th these are people's sons and daughters, mothers, brothers, so Ahana, you know? So um, obviously uh, we have to fix uh, affordable housing is number one. Number two is providing is to have good local jobs. Number three is to kind of reverse the Reagan era idea of getting rid of mental health services, which was crazy. Uh, you know, he's trying to cut taxes and stuff, but you're ending up with <laughs> literally people dying on the streets because they don't, they can't function properly. So um, yeah, anyway, I'm getting too worked up, but 
uh, yeah, that's, I guess that's how I would address it. I can get more granular if you want me to touch on other points, but, um, Totally. I would love to hear like an act, like a action, like, or like in a response of any of those three things. Right. Okay. So, so inside, inside of legislative kind of areas. So affordable housing is a huge one. This will tie in, but what California did was it kind of uh, deregulated um, a lot of the building codes uh, that went down from state all the way down to county levels where they allowed ADUs to be installed on properties. Um, And this is like, obviously amazing because it it adds um you know uh, more stock to the housing market which will in turn lower prices capitalism uh and um and so once you do that in hawaii especially because of the short-term vacation rental situation you'd have to put in the legislation that uh, states or specifies that those new adus would be only for long-term renter renters right so um social services providing uh you know another thing too with the affordable housing is obviously the building department is like super backed up takes years and years to get anything through um huge bureaucratic mess um coming up with new solutions that kind of uh digitize uh the process uh in the building department so that instead of you know a lot of the paperwork having to come into the office them having to sort it you know uh, there could be new solutions. We're, we're in 2022. Like how many of these processes are from the seventies that ne- have never been upgraded? How many offices are still using fax, mas- fax machines? Right. So, sorry, I'm like super on tangent. <laughs> I'll go back to homelessness. So, uh, so yeah, um, specifically affordable housing that needs to happen. Um, and doing a private public partnership with sponsorship programs for the homeless. Like if you create um, groups of, uh, interested citizens. Let's say you create a group of 10 people and they sponsor a homeless person, right? They provide them with a cell phone. They get them into a gym for showers. They provide them with a room maybe to live in. There's only 500 homeless people on Big Island. What are, what's happening? Why can't we help these people, right? So on Oahu, obviously it's a different story, but it's, it's a little bit more simple over here. And I think just having a little bit more action oriented, less bureaucracy, um, and um, yeah, it's a touchy issue. It's a touchy issue, but there are solutions. We can look at other countries in Europe that have zero homelessness. How are they doing it? They're still communist, they're still capitalist, sorry, but um, they're still ha- making it happen. So there's examples all over the world for this. So anyway. Well, thanks for your idea. Yeah. Um, this is kind of um, tangential and you kind of mentioned part of it. So um Let's see. What are your priorities in addressing the issues regarding healthcare access, especially mental health and its affordability in your district? Right. So <clears throat> there's kind of two sides to that. So for addressing homelessness, um, there should be mental health facilities for these people to have access to, right? When you're incapable of taking care of yourself or we have a certain level where you need to be admitted to a facility, that should be um, available for people going through depression, stress, traumas, um, you know, what have you, life stuff. Uh, obviously, that should be included in our healthcare. Um, I think looking at GDP of a country is a terrible index to see how successful we are. I think looking at um, people's lives, how happy they are, how free from afflictions they are, the addiction rates. Um, I think this is a way better indicator of, of where we're at as a society. And so, um, again, the same, the same kind of um, idea with the building department. There's so many processes in the healthcare system that are outdated and antiquated. There's tests that need to be run that are not necessary anymore, that doctors agree should be gotten rid of. Um, there's um, Zoom meetings now, which you can have your primary care physician meet with you at your house instead of driving for two hours to get to the hospital, right? There's things that you can do uh, now with technology that could streamline these processes, make it cheaper, more affordable for people to get in and out of the hospital. Um, and there's, you know, there's ways of, um, you know, I have a couple of friends that are therapists that work for remote therapy um, counseling companies. And so that's very successful. And those things are becoming more and more popular as time goes on as well. So um, obviously state funding um, for different things, um, especially with the healthcare market, affordable housing, all these issues tie together really. 
the nurses can't afford to live near the hospital because the, the rents are too insane. The doctors, uh, you know, the same thing. Um, and we just, we need to figure out like all these issues need to be kind of like uplifted at the same time at the tide, you know, uh, and they're all interconnected. So um, I don't know if, if you want me to get more specific, I can too. If you have follow-ups. That sounds good for now. Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Yeah, of course. Okay, so um, this is kind of switching tides a little bit, um, talking about education um, and labor. So how can we provide avenues for science, technology, um, engineering, and medicine? Engineering. Careers? Yeah, so right. STEM careers um, yep. to our island youth, and then also retain right. them into the workforce when they become of age. Right. So. Um, I'm huge into STEM. I'm huge into trades. I'm a carpenter and welder, um, as well as, you know, doing the art stuff too. But um, I honestly feel like there's a certain um, proportion of kids when they're in school that don't resonate with academic sitting in a desk um, and staring out the window. Uh, I think a lot of kids want to get their hands you know, into a process, they want to see things being built and constructed. I, I love that. That's my, one of my passions to see a project being completed physically. Um, and so I think offering the, the widest assortment of possibilities for kids while they're in education is a necessity. If you don't do that, you get higher uh, high school dropout rates, you get less kids going to college, you get less, a less skilled workforce, right? So, um, so all these things need to be implemented. How do you do it, right? Obviously funding is a huge, huge thing, right? We have, we, we're the only state in good old US of A that doesn't tie property taxes to education funding, which is crazy, but we don't. Um, and so one of the things that a lot of other states have been doing is they've been re-examining their, um, their Nixon era war on drugs stance and looking and saying, hey, everyone's smoking pot can't stop them. Obviously, we tried. Why don't we just legalize recreational use? We can um, take the funding from that as long as it's legislated properly, um, uh, where it's small businesses, locals owning production manufacturing, uh, no large corporations from mainland, uh, integrated in a circular economy on Big Island uh, or in Hawaii in general. Um, and we take that money and we invest it into our kids. And, um, and we invest it into the future, you know, which is what the Keiki are essentially. And so um, doing that would actually provide enough funding. And in Colorado, if you look at the statistics, they're actually giving rebates back to people because their education programs are so well-funded. So <clears throat> that would be my solution. I'm sure it's not the most popular thing. I think it's polling at 43, 42 for yay. So um, we're right at the precipice of it becoming you know, acceptable. I think in our party, it's way, way better, but for general pop, it's about tied. Um, I think if you dress it up with a little bit of mandatory, you know, this is where the funding's going. Here's the statistics about how kids actually use less pot. <laughs> Here's the statistics about how kids get, you know, they get off of the, the pipeline to harder drugs because their drug dealer isn't selling them everything, you know? So um, yeah. That's one of those things. Okay, so we're going to pivot again. And this is about Native Hawaiian rights um, as our host culture and the um, long legacy of um, being not, not having their needs met. So Kanaka Maoli right. Ohana need access to land that's been set aside for their commercial subsistence, recreational, cultural, and residential use. How can you help expedite this process if elected? Right, so um, there's specifically some things that I would leave you know, to the decision-making for people involved more directly with those aspects. Um, I have to be honest and I, I'm not as integrated in those issues uh, as a lot of other issues. Um, and just out of cultural respect, I probably would hire an advisor or bring on someone on the team that could give me the right perspectives and essentially make decisions in that case. Um, so unless you had like specific ideas that I can touch on, um, you know, it, I'd probably leave it at, at there, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> what are your top three priorities for the allocation of infrastructure funding? 
Right. So uh, is this including broadband? Yeah, if that's your, okay. if, I think that can be one of them for sure. Right. So I would do, is this like a top, like a tiered thing or are we doing just like three amorphous? Uh, whatever you feel. Okay, cool. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think broadband is great. I think giving people access to uh, high speed internet is wonderful. Uh, they can do things like video conferencing. They can do remote work. Uh, it, it opens up the economy a lot to um, opportunity. Um, I think going after uh, um, some, you know, outside of the, the internet and stuff like that, I think we would do the power grid and specifically, I don't know if you're, if this touches into energy generation, but uh, becoming more, a little bit more um, unreliant, I guess, or self-sufficient when it comes to power generation. Uh, Cause when you look at the numbers and stuff, it's kind of scary. <clears throat> we're like living on like an eggshell essentially uh, of time if, if we run out of resources. Um, so I think more solar, more wind um, and having um, some more alternative energy sources um, is a great idea, provides green jobs, gets us off of, you know, we're living on an island that's sinking essentially. So for us to be using petroleum so heavily is kind of insane. Um, and so we need to become like a greener state, I think, um, and get our en energy independence, get rid of kind of the NIMBY, NIMBYism, you know, I don't want solar over here, or over there, um, but kind of break up the, break up the power structure surrounding where we get our, our power from is a huge one. Um, and yeah, uh, I guess there's, a, there's a bunch of other things in infrastructure, but I would say internet, uh, power is huge um and <clears throat> i know this is like kind of like a local issue but there's like traffic stuff you know uh so like people are sitting in traffic a long time uh that's kind of a bummer i i do it um so we have to address those issues why is that happening uh maybe including busing for kids is a good idea to kind of cut down on all the kids hitting the road at the same time uh all the people hitting the road at the same time um yeah so traffic would be a concern. I'm probably missing a huge one. <laughs> um, That's okay. We have additional questions. Okay, great. I love additional questions. Let's do it. So here's another one. If elected, how can you help fill the infrastructure funding gap to mitigate the severe cesspool and sewer system issues on the west side of the island Ooh. and far exceed the county's ability to fund it on its own? Wow, that's a huge issue. Um, right, so request for state funding um, would be a thing for sure. Um, and maybe if things are getting to the point where there's contamination in the water supply, emergency funding requests. Um, and so I have some ideas and this is, this is pretty progressive and left-leaning, but um, for income generation across the board, um, I think we can um, start bringing in money through other means. And I think doing things like empty home taxes is a good one. If you've got a corporation that owns seven houses and they're empty because they're speculative, uh, I think that those need to be kind of dealt with. I think a lot of the, you know, these are, these are ultimately ethics issues if you have people that can't afford to live where they're working. So I think we're, uh, it's about time to kind of um, start taxing the rich, I guess, is the easiest way of saying it. Um, and bringing in income from people that have been, um, you know, making tons of money doing vacation rentals, corporations, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah. So would, just as a kind of a follow-up to that, would like a green tax for tourists or anything fall into your right. idea? Yeah, like for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Doing a green tax um, for not only yeah, tourists in general, but corporations as well. Um, so if they're um, operating in Hawaii, it would be really amazing if they had some, uh, you know, larger contributions to the community, since it is a spe it's not it's not mainland, it's a special environment that we're in. And I think they need to people need to realize that and see that the economy, the way it's structured is so different from mainland that we need to create more sets of conditions that support um, the local people here. Um, 
because if we just go laissez-faire it's going to get pretty crazy you know mm -hmm. cool and then um i'm going to switch up uh the next question um is about um plastic so plastic marine debris pollutes our shorelines emits greenhouse gases and harms corals and other um, marine species and seabirds what legislation to reduce plastic and use trans and transition to a circular economy would you support right so um side note we're actually doing a beach cleanup with hawaii Fi next month uh so i'm huge into cleaning up the shoreline um and um also hate plastics and their use or their misuse because if we want to get you know scientific about it um they've been a huge benefit for the human race as far as like the medical field a lot of you know technology and stuff relies on plastics the misuse of plastics is a huge problem so um I think getting rid of disposable, you know, um, food containers obviously is number one step. I think, you know, if we're gonna do outright restrictions on things, is a is a great one too. Um, looking at doing studies, they've already done studies, but trying to figure out what what is making up the bulk of the um, the plastic waste, you know, so um, addressing those issues um, and even. <clears throat> to mitigate the problem, obviously that's preventative. Um, there's literal tons of plastic on the shorelines over in South Point, especially there's a, a, ma a massive amounts. You can walk there all day and we picked up 300 pounds last time we were out. Um, and that was with 13 people or something or 12 people. So um, doing programs for, you know, what in my ideal utopian vision would be to have ecotourism being promoted so that people can come to the island and not just consume things, they can give back and make and beautify and feel like they're a part of something beautiful. Because I think at this time, it's 2022, people want that, especially people in my generation, especially that they want to feel like they're not just going somewhere and taking resources away and not contributing, so. Onto your muted. Onto your, you're muted. Oh, I'm muted? Oh. No, no it is me. I, in my turn. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me start over. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm pivoting again, and this one is about schools. So our West Side public school facilities need maintenance, expansion, and renovation. For example, Hololoa Elementary School was established in 1895 and is composed of over 80% are old temporary portables. What would you do to get the CIP funding needed for your district? Right. Um, like I was saying, uh, with school funding in general, um, I'd push for legislation to legalize marijuana and provide funding through that route. Um, I would also look into it have to be, um, you know, kind of research based about what we would need to do to get property taxes incorporated in public school funding. Um, and yeah, there's like, there's only so many sources of income that you can pull from and where, where we're at this place, it's, it's tough, you know, especially with budgets the way they are. So yeah, those would be my main two solutions. Thank you. Are there any yep. other, um, any other measures you would propose to increase the quality of our public schools? Um, yeah, tons. Like as as we were saying before, the STEM thing, the trades thing is huge, um, and I think <clears throat> because we're such a unique um, state, uh, we have to look at like what our advantages and disadvantages are. Obviously, being on a remote island chain in the middle of the Pacific Ocean uh, doesn't do a lot for people being able to work, you know, mainland and figure out uh, sources of income, et cetera, like that. We can provide kids with opportunities to you know, work in remote fields, uh, design, engineering. Um, there's millions of things that they can do uh, over the internet now. So that would be a huge, um, you know, addition to the school curriculum, I think, is to provide things that allow kids to be more self-sufficient here. Um, and yeah, arts, arts, obviously, and music uh, is huge for me. Uh, like I run a nonprofit doing that for kids. So um, I think doing more school funding for those as well, 
um, just for mental health. Like we have to obviously stop thinking about schools as like a employee factory uh, because that is what is causing our dropout rates um, in the first place. So we have to look at um, what's gonna create and develop more fully formed people that are gonna contribute to society and make better decisions about how they spend their lives and how they treat others. So um, that's the ultimate kind of goal for me, I think for schools. So yeah, just across the board, arts, arts, music, STEM, um, technology is huge. So there's a lot of like archaic stuff with the education system that obviously you guys probably know about, but you know, curriculums that look like they're from the fifties, uh, what they're teaching kids about history is not quite correct a lot of times. Um, so yeah, so that would be kind of where I would sit with that. I just had one follow-up question with the education. So um, mm -hmm. would you support workforce, educational workforce housing then? How so? So like housing for the educators, um, like- Oh, right, by, yeah, by the that's- of education. Amazing, that's a great, I haven't thought of that. That's an amazing thing for sure. Like um, if you tied something in with state rebates or incentives programs to house teachers, uh, that would be, a really clean, beautiful way of dealing with that issue. I agree. Yes, I would do that for sure. Cool. Okay, uh, food security and agriculture. Uh, how would you support increasing the local food production and make it easier and more affordable to access fresh, local, healthy food? Right. So <clears throat> it is weird. Uh, in Hawaii, you walk into a supermarket and you see avocados from Mexico, and then you walk 20 feet and there's one rotting on the ground. Uh, and then <clears throat> you're kind of like, what's going on here? Something is not working properly. So um, I think I think doing looking into modernizing our food, food distribution system is huge. Um, I think uh, creating like a committee or a research group to look at like how that would get implemented as far as like, um, because obviously it's a, it's a complicated supply chain. You have supermarkets that have demand from the population. The population kind of um, will, you know, it's a market, so they'll kind of say, we want this and that. So if you don't have a, a, a well-run distribution system, it won't be efficient enough to compete with mainlands where they're trucking in shipping containers full of avocados at exactly the right time. So they're ripe on this day. You know, it's pretty wild. It's impressive what what we have in our modern economy. So I think modernizing a lot of our um, agricultural uh, sector is huge. Uh, having communications, uh, clear ones between farmers, figuring out what, what uh, fruits and veggies are, are, are readily available, then distributing, having like a shared uh, common distribution system, trucks, um, you know, ordering systems for supermarkets. You want to basically, we're working on a capitalist system still, unfortunately. So we have to figure out ways of working within that system to support our local economy. So um, yeah, modernization for sure, incentivizing local um, uh, uh, farmers, um, supporting them. Part of, part of that as well is like, <clears throat> um, you know, do you, the, the age old question is like, do you decentivize certain things, right? Do you put tariffs on imports, right? And you can, right? And that would generate income and stuff. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm more of the opinion that you try out things, you try out incentives first. So you try to get the system up to speed and see where we're sitting when it's kind of functioning properly. So yeah, I think agriculturally doing, doing way more support for farmers um, and yeah, I think I answered that, right? Okay. <laughs> How would you support the farmers though? Like, um, like as an, like a specific example, how would you support like the ag agricultural sector of your district or the farmers in your district? Right, so um, definitely farm grants, farm subsidies are huge um, and um, an income stream. Um, also with doing kind of like deregulating a little bit um, of housing situations. Like what I was saying with the ADUs um, for adding them onto properties, farmers will be able to do that um, as well. So they have another stream of income. Um, and 
basically, you know, through the modernization of the distribution system in Hawaii, they would be getting more commerce. They'd be selling more produce. So that would be a huge thing. Um, I think, I think public private partnerships if done correctly. Uh, it's not like a third way Bill Clinton kind of thing, but uh, more of like a, a governmental side partnering with, you know, private, private companies, corporations, we could figure out ways to, to do that. Um, so we're not like creating large inefficient government bodies that require tons of funding. We try to figure out how we can streamline things, make them more efficient. Cool. I think it's my turn again. Okay, I have one more um, question. Um, so yeah. have you followed the issues related to the Huhanua bioenergy plant? And do you feel informed enough to stake out your present position? Um, I've touched on it very briefly. Um, and the second one, honestly, no, I'd have to delve into the research and stuff and see what what's going on with the situation is. Um, yeah, one of my things is like, I'm, I feel well versed enough in certain things, but if there's issues that are complicated enough, I usually get on the phone, I try to find the most uh, intelligent person surrounding that specific area. And then I'll ask them, are you the smartest guy? And he'll go, no, actually it's Jim over there. And then I'll call Jim and say, hey, are you the smartest guy and do that until I find the guy that I'm actually listening to. So that's one of the, my, the staples of the campaign too, is I'm not gonna be brash with my decision-making. I'm gonna pull in as many ex experts from as many different fields as possible and get a very fleshed out perspective on, on issues. So do you guys wanna touch on that at all? Cause I'd love to, unless you wanna do it later maybe, but like what oh, is the situation? I feel like you wouldn't like it anyways. Well, the whole point is they wanna burn eucalyptus trees. Um, for energy and then call it green mm -hmm. energy and um it's stalled a lot because there's been um a big a big uh, local activist um like group of people that have um done all these lawsuits and stuff i'm forgetting the specific names <laughs> um right of the groups but yeah so uh, i don't think you would like it but it's definitely still a zombie that like won't go away at the right yeah, cool. If you guys want to send any literature over to me after the thing or during in chat, that'd be great. I'd like to take a look for sure. Cool. Okay, Ilya, um, do you have any kind of last words, any areas that we didn't touch on that you wanted to mention that are particularly important to you that see would be relevant for this district? Right. Um, yeah, environmental stuff. We have two step. We have uh, Kelkakua Bay, we have some of the most beautiful diving. I'm, I'm a free diver, uh, not great, I'm okay. Uh, but uh, I'm in the ocean all the time. I love it, it's like my favorite place. So um, activism, environmental protection, huge for me. Um, obviously wildlife in general is huge for me. Um, I'm also a cat person. Um, and so I think we should get all the cats off the street because they're also eating all the birds, which you want as well to keep around. Um, so figuring out, you know, as far as animals, um, figuring out how to fund the animal control to fund pounds um, to get these cats off the street would be great. Uh, and, you know, protect our, our reefs, obviously with the um, bans on non-mineral sunscreens would be huge. Um, and generally, yeah, protectionism, uh, within reason, you know. Um, I can't think of anything else I want to say. Yeah, I think we're good. Um, uh -huh. Jeff? I was just checking to see if Monica had another question. I'm Is good. Thank you, Jeff. All right, well, thank you, Ilya, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it and uh, hope that you do well in your endeavor to <clears throat> become the house rep for District 6. Also like awesome. to thank uh, both our interviewers, Antu Harvey and Monica Stone. Uh, Uli Pack, we're building something that the political establishment's never seen before, a uh, slate of Pono leaders. And uh, your donation can buoy the, the system. It would really help if you could make donations. Uh, for more information and to make a donation, please visit ulihai.com, H-U-L-I-H-I.com. 
Thanks again for everybody for joining us this evening. Thanks. Awesome. Mahalo, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your night.